Hello and welcome to a new episode here on the War of Rebellion podcast for H Soul War. I'm your host, Niels Eichhorn, and today I have a guest whom I have known for, as we just discussed, a long time, <laughs> 14 years at least, uh, we think. Yeah, we <laughs> Potentially think. Potentially a little more. And I'm going to welcome today Aaron Maris. He is a historian in the U.S. State Department or Department of State. I'm going to get that right here, Department of State. He works primarily with modern stuff regarding Sub-Saharan Africa, but he also holds a PhD from the University of South Carolina. Um, as football season is around the corner, don't have any ideas right now please. He, I'm going to mention the second book he did first, because he actually got a little help, and I have it somewhere on my shelf, which is the book Foreign Relations of the United States 1917 to 1972, Public Diplomacy. I think that dealt with the foreign relations Bruce books, and you kind of got a little bit of correspondence from me from Hamburg on that one. Yes. <laughs> but he is also a 19th century transport, travel, movement historian, I guess we would call it, because he also wrote Railroads in the Old South. And the one we're going to talk about today is the newest one, The American Transportation Revolution, A Social and Cultural History which came out in April of 2024 with Johns Hopkins University Press. So first of all, thank you so much, Aaron, for joining me here today, uh, taking time out of the taxpayer-funded State Department work. And yeah, so tell us how, I guess, first of all, how did you come to continue working on the 19th century when you are constantly surrounded by modern day politics and let's go with that first yeah th thank you so much it's a great question and i do i want to start by thanking you for having me i'm uh, delighted to um see you again even if it's only on the screen and uh, and talk to you about history um I was trained as a 19th century historian, uh, as you mentioned, in my doctoral work at the University of South Carolina. And uh, I just uh, continued to uh, have an interest. I think it's a fascinating time period. Uh, a lot of interesting questions uh, that sort of remain to be explored. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, as best I have been able to uh, over the course of um the past um, 18 years working at the Department of State uh, during nights and weekends uh, and, you know, moments of annual leave and some uh, leave without pay to go do research. Um, I've uh, managed to continue to working on the 19th century um, separately from my uh, separately from my job. So um just try, trying to keep a foot in both. I mean, obviously, for my day, you know, daytime employment, uh, keeping track of uh, historiography of U.S. foreign relations there, and uh, but I still really enjoy and find fascinating uh, the 19th century. So I've been doing that um, uh, on my on my own time ever since. Yeah, I guess the 19th century holds a lot of appeal, considering how many of the Cold War historians all of a sudden are like last books they write or third books they write is all of a sudden on the 19th century and kind of like okay hey, well, welcome yeah, yeah. there yeah yeah well, well welcome there's there there's room for everyone it's uh I, I think there are a lot of great um uh a lot of great resources great questions so it's a it's a fascinating time period to work in yeah exactly and this one is an interesting one because your first book was on railroads, so you're continuing with the railroad scene, but now you're also seeing throwing um, steamships into your conversation. So I guess I'm going to ask first, why did you feel there was the was a need for a book that sort of in a, in in the way you did, so that you can explain mm -hmm. that to the audience a little bit, um, looked at steam transportation, both on rails and on water? 
Yeah, there's the the historiography of American transportation is is rich, but there were a couple aspects of it that I thought could use some uh, some tweaking. Um, and and one of the probably the principal aspect is that a lot of the uh, historiography is focused on uh, sort of economics and politics, and uh, and rightfully so. Uh, I mean, that's uh, economics are, are sort of why so many of the boosters wanted these transportation. Uh, developments to move forward it's moving goods it's moving people it's uh decreasing the cost of transportation across the board so that makes total sense and then on the political side uh there are a lot of um you know political conversations and innovations chartering corporations that sort of thing that had to happen uh in in order for this to move forward and so at the time period we're looking at in the early 19th century you know th that's still sort of um, innovative and there's a lot of you know, really interesting work going on there. Um, another aspect of the history of transportation after the Civil War uh, is that there's a really uh, nicely well-developed historiography that talks about social and cultural history, but mostly just considers the postbellum period. So there's wonderful work on women in transportation, um, on travel, on African Americans and train, you know, so on and mm -hmm. so forth, you know, run down the list of topics, but mostly it considers these topics after the Civil War is concluded. And so what I wanted to do, um, I think sort of two, two, two things that spurred the creation of the second book. One, uh, when I started my dissertation, uh, which became my first book, I thought that I was going to have a much broader comparative aspect mm. uh, to it. Okay. And I quickly realized that if I was ever going to graduate, I needed to <laughs> pare back. <laughs> Couldn't research the entire North and the entire South uh, and, and hope to finish. And uh, of course, finishing is a critical aspect of uh, graduate school. Yeah, uh, And so, uh, so I, I, I pared that back and concentrated, lar you know, largely on the South mm. in that first book. But so when that was over, I still had a little shoebox of research that I'd started and I wanted to uh, expand that further. And so yeah. that was one um, one genesis. And then the other was just just I knew from my reading of the primary research that the people living in the United States during this time period, they themselves did not um, classify. They, they didn't sort of put into different boxes right. these types of transportation. Just as, you know, when I fly home to visit my parents, I walk to the metro, then I get on the metro to the airport, then I get mm -hmm. on the plane to Iowa, and then my yeah. parents are picking up in their car. It's That's one, two, three, four, five different types of transportation, yeah. But it's all seamless in yeah. one in one sort of movement, yeah. and so um, I wanted to try to treat uh, all aspects of steam transit, railroads, and steamboats um, as sort of one unified experience, mm -hmm. uh, because that's how the antebellum Americans saw themselves. Right. Yeah. No. It's uh, that makes total sense. It's they say we don't think it's like it's it's point A to point B, and they it's sort of one process that we go through in that. Yeah. Right. That's, no, right. that's a great, brilliant way of thinking there. <laughs> we, we, it, it, yeah. You know, sometimes you don't think of like breaking things down to that level that is so normal to us and was probably normal to them on a, on a scale too. <laughs> yeah. I mean the, that normalization um, idea and process is also is another thing that really intrigued me and yeah. is also something where I think the cultural, you know, uh, you're setting, you're moving away from the economics and politics for a second and looking at the cultural, I think that's part of where we see that uh, normalization. The, um, the anecdote uh, that opens the book, uh, which is of a, a young lady in Texas seeing the railroad for the first time, and she writes in her diary that everything seems perfectly normal mm -hmm. because of everything she had read and heard. Um, and so to me, uh, that was one of those moments as a researcher where you're like, yes, this is <laughs> this perfectly encapsulates the <laughs> the 
uh, the uh, the argument that I'm mm -hmm. uh, trying to make because yeah. um, there was so much cultural production mm -hmm. uh, happening in the early 19th century mm -hmm. that someone who had never seen, I mean, by 1860, railroads are everywhere, but they weren't in her part of Texas. <laughs> and so uh, for for her to be able to experience so much through culture that when she finally did see one for the first time, it appeared normal. Um, that's the sort of transformation and um, examining cultural production that I was really interested in doing. Yeah, totally. Um, and I'm glad you already mentioned the words that I was going to go with next, even though I it's sort of hidden up there on that shelf, like down <laughs> that road. <laughs> um, because you do kind of talk a little about like the this period. We're looking at the antebellum. We're looking at sort of the antebellum 1850s, but also sort of the late, like whatever we want to call it, yeah. 1840s. And we had so many different names for it, right? We had like the age of Jackson at one point. Then we had the like... Um, market revolution that we described it at and then the, the most recent that i at least can sing of like daniel house's age of transformation and mm -hmm. uh, you you kind of seem to agree with how in this transformation but you also seem to like wanting to complicate it a bit more yeah i so i mean I thought transportation revolution was appropriate. Um, I mean, in, in, in part because I'm, uh, I mean, as the title of the book, I mean, in part because that's what I'm focused on. Uh, so I'm trying to sort of draw attention uh, to that. And, but, but I like your point about complicating because obviously for, you know, for George Rogers Taylor and, um, and, you know, other people who have written about transportation revolution, um, you know, back several decades ago, mm -hmm. um, it was that earlier, mostly economic story that they were trying to tell unsuccessfully. I'm like, mm -hmm. I have no, I have no truck with that scholarship. It's wonderful work. But I, so I was trying to do was borrow that same term, but turn our focus a little bit mm -hmm. um, towards other aspects of what was, of what was going on. Um, I, uh, you're, you're right. We do have a variety of different terms for this 1810 to 1860 um, time period. Um, my guess is that, um, you know, scholars are going to uh, select whichever one they think is most um, resonant uh, mm -hmm. for, for the work that they're doing. Uh, and for me, transportation revolution was still appropriate because as i as i hope is clear from the the contents when people write about their experiences uh revolution is entirely appropriate way to mm -hmm. to, to think about it they were they were blown away uh by what these machines were able to uh change in their lives yeah right i mean it's like the 50s when the airplane starts for a lot of people and it's it's just or the, the wheel for the first human then uh, yeah there's certain moments where it just it's it everything changes in that yes um, yes even though today in the united states railroads it's sort of like what's that <laughs> yeah i mean it's, it's it's kind of interesting railroads in the united states today play um they play a huge role in freight right. um but they are but they are almost but they are largely hidden from yep. Uh, what most Americans experience. Now, I live in the Northeast Corridor, so I'm in one area where rail you passenger do. rail travel still uh, still functions uh, pretty yeah. well. But um, you are correct that you know, for I think for most Americans, they don't think about trains day to day. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of the goods uh, that they use um, have traveled some part of their journey by train to get to to get to the store where they bought them. Uh, so trains do play a massive role in freight right now, but they are sort of hidden from yeah. the from the larger cultural conversation. It is sort of an irony when you think of it, how the United States had this massive rail network for passenger travel and cargo travel and the rivers were arteries of transport. And like today you look at like Europe and it's like, or in the United States, there's a couple of cruise ships that go up to down the Mississippi and 
like couple literally and then in Europe you have like dozens like a, we lived in near Linz for a while and it's like there were sometimes were five or six ships <laughs> there was cruise passengers wow. and, yeah yeah uh, and you, from there you could take a train and be in an hour in, in Salzburg you know it's like it's just the kind of modality of travel that you mentioned there was Iowa it's 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 incredible how things have changed in that or revolutionized yeah. if you like yeah yeah I mean the, the stuff is always evolving so so yeah. I mean who, who knows uh anything anything's possible yeah no you you did mention that and I love that part right it's like when you when we think about where you're living in in the Washington area and then New York, Boston, that is a corridor, an artery, and uh, that we still have a lot of travel in. And as I, I, I read your book fairly closely, I might not have picked up everything, I'll admit that, but I did notice a lot of references to like Massachusetts and New York and sort of the mid-Atlantic and New England states. And I noticed there was a lot of like, and you mentioned that in the introduction to that that was sort of what happened as a result of the way you found materials, that it was more about mm -hmm. railroads at times than it was about steamships. And I kind of wondered, like, like how did you approach your sources? What did you, where did you find some, like, like I, I don't think you found a treasure trove somewhere that no one had ever looked at, but you kind of, I assume, read again, read sources differently. And yeah that's a that's a great question um a lot of this was uh reading diaries mm. and hoping that at some point somebody got on a train or a steamboat <laughs> and, oh and if, how's that and seem tedious and, and it, well i i mean it was I, I learned a lot and i mean the good news is people did travel <laughs> and so so as a general rule um it, it was they they were relatively high uh, percentage shots uh and and i like reading you know the primary sources i mean that's the that's the fun one of the fun parts of being a historian so it wasn't that um it, it was okay but it was um it, you know it's it's interesting um uh, you know to the point about sources you, you are correct that there wasn't um i don't think i turned over um a lot of new things it's in terms of um you know i've read the same railroad annual reports that everyone else has been reading um but history starts with questions right mm -hmm. i mean we we start out with a question and we try to um and and the questions that we have mm -hmm. lead us to read sources in ways that are different than people who who read them with different questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, I think that part of what, um, so part of what I was doing was just looking looking at the material with different questions. And if I can borrow an example from the first book momentarily, um, the, the, the big thing that sort of clued me into that possibility was a material on slavery. Mm -hmm. um, these annual annual reports of Southern Railroad Corporations are just chock full of um, mm -hmm. material about slavery. Um, but if you're not going through asking questions about that, if you're consider if you're worried about how are these things funded and how did they mm -hmm. sell bonds and you know all that sort of thing, um, this is not part of what you're going to be uh, looking for. So it, I, I, part of this is looking at similar sources. Uh, with different questions which is something mm -hmm. historians do all the time right. i obviously you know i didn't invent that um but a lot of it was um through um well i read a lot of things that are not cited in the book right <laughs> so <laughs> it's just you yeah you, you, i can imagine you just you just, just got to read a lot of material and um excuse me <laughs> read, read a lot of material and um and the, the great news is when you do come across stuff, it's usually fantastic uh, because mm -hmm. people are writing in their, you know, they're writing their private thoughts in their diaries or writing to their friends. And uh, so many of the evocative um, metaphors uh, mm -hmm. that ordinary people used mm -hmm. to describe their travel experience. Um, I mean, those are all diaries, letters, personal, mm -hmm. personal stuff. But it takes it, it takes a lot of reading. Yeah. Um, to get there um well on the geo on the geographic mm -hmm. um issue 
Um, I certainly tried <laughs> as best I could uh, to uh, to get a to get a swath of America, um, and I would hope that if other people uh, with better access to resources in other areas uh, can uh, can can do that, that would um, uh, that would be you know I, I'm 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 always in favor of you know more people studying this stuff. So I hope I hope it can happen. Well, you know, I mean, you had to, you had to read closely at times to kind of spot that. So I'm, I'm not sure how much people will notice it as well, sort of like it. Um, but I, I kind of was going back to your story from Texas, right? Of like how, like when that lady sees the train for the first time, it's like, oh yeah, that's how a train looks, right? It's not something, it's not something special. It's something normal for her. And Yeah. I kind of was going to say, wonder about like, isn't that also sort of a danger with regard to your research? Because, right, the more normal something is for us, the less we would record and talk about it. Yeah, and so I, I, a lot of these descriptions that I found are of uh, the first time Okay. uh, that Yeah. someone stepped Mm hmm. on. It's the first time someone stepped on a steamboat, the first time someone stepped on a railroad. Now, the nice thing, I mean, in terms of volume of research, is that that experience is something that expands geographically and over time, right? So you live in Massachusetts, your first uh, experience on a, or or New York State, your first experience on a steamboat is going to be very early. And, but, you know, as you move West, it's later. So there's always time to, uh, people's first can happen chronologically over that whole 50 year span. Uh, so there's still plenty to, it's not like everything changed in 1810 and then like, that was it. Um, there as the Sally McNeil, the woman on page one demonstrates, you know, there was still plenty of time for people to have their first experience um but you're you're right as when you in, in terms of reading similar diary entries and letters uh from people who have experience how they write about it changes right and it's sort of like um the first time you experience it may be amazing and then 10 years later um you're frustrated that it's not working as well as you wanted to right it's uh so you you go from you go from being amazed uh, Mm to being annoyed <laughs> and, and you know why isn't this thing working um -hmm. Right. 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 and uh the the other thing that i think um the, the experience over time uh what you see people writing is um they start to share uh with other people Uh, their own, uh, you know, tips and tricks, Mm -hmm. uh, if you will, as they grow in their own experience. So people are still writing about it, but what they write changes Mm -hmm. um, uh, over time, and that changes over geography. <laughs> and Yeah. so, Yeah. 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 so you can have someone super experienced in uh, Pennsylvania in 1850 and a neophyte in Mississippi in 1850. And um, uh, so it's just... sort of interesting to track that across Mm time -hmm. and space. Yeah, it's sort of like when you, like, you know, like we don't fly that much as individuals, but then you have these frequent flyers that on YouTube always post all their stuff and you're kind of like, yeah, that's great, but I'm not never going to have the miles to upgrade all the time. <laughs> yeah, like, all those Yeah. little, those little things where you're kind of like, yeah. but yeah, like, yeah, it's sort of something that's very contemporary still, if you want. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, um, yeah, I mean, that, that probably applies to any technology, right? I mean, this, uh, um, I, you know, distinctly remember the first time uh, my parents bought a computer and we had a computer Yeah. Mm in the home, -hmm. Yeah. uh, whereas Yeah. Yeah. previously we did not. And, you know, now I carry something in my pocket that is uh, Hundred an times, impress <laughs> million times a bigger. million times more powerful Yeah. <laughs> than... than our first Apple II C. Uh, so, uh, which did not even have a hard drive, right? I mean, it just, it was, uh, um, and so, you know, I, for any technology, this is going to be the case. People come in at different uh, moments and Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, totally. different experiences. And um, what was once uh, uh, incredible does, starts to seem commonplace. Yeah, no, exactly right.
Oh, all right, let's turn like uh, your your book is interestingly organized and it so fits I feel like the the theme of of that period because you hardly ever get a chronological work of this 1810 to 1860 period because it just doesn't work, right? It, yeah. it just doesn't. You you have to approach it somatically like you teach it somatically, you write about it somatically and you kind of nicely broke it up in sort of different different topic areas to kind of showcase how these different modes of transportation you know, became part of social norm. Mm -hmm. And I want to start with community because community seemed like that, that, that big topic, right? Of like, like a new railroad wants to come in and you had to work with the communities. You, you, you had is issues. You had to deal with the community, the community, like, wanted more frequencies or the opening happens, the artisans come out. So how important was that relationship? But then also how good were the railroads or the steamships in maintaining and fostering those relationships? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. And with, um, you know, hundreds of different corporations operating across the country. By the time we get to 1860, there, mm -hmm. there probably is going to be gradations on yeah. answering that. Um, so I, um, anywhere, but um, I, I think the relationships were extremely important, uh, particularly with the railroad. Um, you know, a steamboat is um, obviously a great technological achievement, but people had seen boats. Mm -hmm before <laughs> yeah, yeah. and they're and they're using existing waterways mm -hmm. uh but a, a railroad uh in addition to being a new invention something people mm -hmm. hadn't seen before had to uh sort of impose itself on the landscape mm -hmm. and almost always there's something already there uh right. that has to be uh replaced mm -hmm. and so that involves negotiation uh, that involves, um, you know, working with landowners. Mm -hmm. uh, that involves disputes over how much they think the land is worth. Um, and and I we think... don't have eminent domain yet, so you can't just right. take it. <laughs> right. And so this is a, um, a, it's a tricky problem. And I think that, you know, railroad corporations uh, worked very hard to, you uh, educate people about the benefits mm -hmm. of what uh excuse me about um about what would happen when the railroad came through um you know sometimes corporations had to make uh, concessions sometimes mm -hmm. landowners had to make concessions right. there are sort of constant debates about who's going to build the fence who's going to maintain the fence so you're going to uh, uh right. all, all that sort of thing um I, I think for the most part, these things worked out, right? Because we did do railroads did eventually get built <laughs> mm -hmm. all, all over the country. Right. And it is one of those things that sort of as after the first ones are constructed, then people do can see, read about or see for themselves um, whether or not the benefits that the corporations promise are, are, you know, quote unquote, true or not. Mm -hmm. Um so um, the community community re relations were, I think, very very important. And I've forgotten the second part of your question. Um, well, I can't, uh, we're just going to go on from here. Okay. Because, I, I mean, okay. actually, uh, let's, <laughs> let's think about that because I, I loved the, the kind of way how you were like, and it, again, so spoke to this period, right? Of like, the town wants a railroad and it's like, you have to buy it almost, right? You have to bribe the railroad company or you, the surveyor needs to be, is getting bribed to suggest that I you should direct the railroads this way. And it, it seems like so, it so fits the period. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, I, I think the example you're referring to is from Minnesota where uh, people approached the engineer uh, who, a civil engineer uh, who then swore that he would never, you know, accept a bribe from anyone who knows uh but it's um i think that speaks to um i mean there's just always tension right mm -hmm. uh the uh the 
civil engineers have their one vision of how things, you know, if you just look at the topography and say, okay, this is where it has to go, right. but it's never just a matter of topography. <laughs> and yeah. there's, there's already people there and they may have their own um, agendas or their own um, ideas of where they want to see the railroad uh, go. And so it's never a simple matter of, well, this is the, um, the most logical route from a civil engineering perspective. So off we go. Uh, there's always, there's always politics involved. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the fascinating thing about a railroad to me, or one of the fascinating things is that, um, it, it had the ability to, uh, improve a town's standing, obviously mm -hmm. if the yeah. railroad goes through, but there's nothing preventing the railroad from continuing to go on. <laughs> and so, uh, unless there's some geographic barrier. So uh, you can lobby the, the railroad and become a terminus and become very profitable, but if it keeps going and then you're turned into a race station, so there are no guarantees yeah. uh, in this um, life uh, that just because the you convince the railroad that it's going to end up uh, having permanent benefits. So this is a topic that um, I don't think ever ends. Uh, it's yeah. it's always is sort of constantly weighing uh, between what the corporate corporations interests are and, and the different communities that it has to work with. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like the story of Buffalo Bill buys like that town out in what is West Texas, West Kansas or Nebraska. And he's trying to get the railroads there. The railroads just like never comes. <laughs> It's like it's just this disaster, financial disaster for him. Yeah, yeah, and 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 it, and it um, it's um, it's just uh, the competing different interests that have yeah. to be weighed. And um, I think for me, what's really interesting about this time period is that the corporations do have to do a lot of education mm -hmm. uh, to teach yeah. people what a railroad actually mm -hmm. is, uh, down to like. It's on tracks. It's got yeah. wheels, and um, I, you know, we were talking, you know, a bit about what makes this period interesting. And and one of the things is that some of the things that we consider settled were not settled. Yeah. Uh, you know, and one of one of those questions, of course, is like who will, um, who gets to use the tracks? So yeah. the the idea yeah. that one company owning the tracks and owning the rolling stock and doing all the operation, yeah. that was not a settled question. And there were some cases where rails were put down and then uh, anybody could bring their car mm -hmm. on. Pretty quickly, it was obvious that wasn't going to work <laughs> and from a from like a time management perspective. But mm -hmm. it's one of those things they didn't know until they right. tried. Right. So. Well, and it, it uh, I was actually saying you were going to go a different direction there with, with yeah. that because... You also have these stories of people walking on the tracks and then falling asleep on them, uh, much to the. Um, I'm sorry, you. Yeah, I'm I sorry, know. you just froze on me. <laughs> it's okay, I will repeat um, it here. But the walking okay. on the tracks, right? Like people walk on the tracks. It, it kind of reminded me of like a story that my classmates in Germany talked about. Like, oh yeah, we were on the last train. We just walked on the tracks back to our town where the train didn't go and i kind of was like why would you do that but but you have it right it's like people fall asleep on the tracks and then the train comes yeah this this is a uh this is a concept in the history of technology uh which was just really important to me uh you know as i was in graduate school learning about this stuff and then trying to apply it into my later work which is the the, the inventor of a technology and the users of a technology may have completely different ideas about mm -hmm. how the technology is supposed to be used. Right. And, uh, you know, to your, you know, you're worried about your friends, you know, the train tracks are the one place where you are guaranteed to get hit yes. <laughs> by a train. Um, uh, You know, I mean, it needs to be level. It needs to be clear debris. It needs mm -hmm. to drain water. Uh, it needs to be a relatively efficient connection between two points, even if it's not the straightest. Um, those are all some great for walking. 
Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so people made their own use uh, of this technology uh, in, a, in a way that the corporation uh, either did not expect or certainly did not intend. Yeah. And, um, you know, as your own example alludes, walking on the tracks has not left us. That's not a purely 19th century invention. Um, but once you put a technology out there, uh, people are going to use find different ways to use it that may not be what the inventor expected. Um, which means that the, the, the people who invented it had to then consider what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. You know, what do we do about this problem? And right. so it's a, for me, that's a great example of, of uh, how users and inventors uh, can have different uh, uh, concepts of what a technology is for mm -hmm. um, and uh, what it's supposed to be used for to be things that the inventors expect. Right. <clears throat> and I, I'm sorry, I lost you again. Did you get any of that? <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm not sure it shouldn't be an, an unstable connection. I'm actually on the good network, but I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but it, it, it may be it may be me i'm yeah, sorry well, it's okay that's that's a pitfall of these kind of recording types um but i actually was thinking too because you had that wonderful episode from from michigan like it's, it's just like two paragraphs but it, it caught my eye where you were like livestock gets killed by the railroad and what do the farmers do they go and take revenge by greasing the tracks. Yeah, you know, it's like, but it, it so speaks to right these conflicts over land of usage of the land, how the railroad interrupts farming habits, right? And it's like it just, it's again spoke so much to just not just the start of railroads, but the continuation of railroads, right? Of like, it's still a problem in parts of yeah. the country. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a case where I'm, I'm sure those farmers benefited from, from being able to ship and receive goods on the train, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean they wanted the train to kill their livestock. <laughs> so it's like sort of like just be just because we, uh, you know, accept this and, and mm -hmm. think it's a good idea. doesn't mean we're going to let you get away with everything. Right. Um, so it's a, um, a another great reminder about um, how um did just these relationships they were complex they were not always mm -hmm. straightforward um and you know as you say with sort of uh greasing the tracks um i did people weren't afraid to um to take their own actions to defend yeah. what they saw as their rights yeah like i guess you could think of sort of those guys that glue themselves to runways and roads in europe to kind of grow awareness like it, it, how do you get people to pay attention? Well, grease the tracks. Um, yeah. Um, so let's go a different route because you, the other part that I found interesting because it's so common for us, right? Of like, I can go online and I can book a ticket today from Hamburg to Washington. And if I, like, let's say I book it with, no, I'm not going to promote any airlines here. <laughs> <laughs> they don't pay me for it. Like whichever airline I book it with, um, they will probably be like, "Ooh, do you want a rental car with that? Do you need a hotel with that? Do you need an airport shuttle with that?" And it it, it is exactly like like I mean, you look at travel logs or travel guides for the 19th century. You look at newspapers. Um, that's exactly what they did too, right? Of like. Your train arrives in Cincinnati at this time, and the continuing train to Louisville leaves at this time, or the steamboat to St. Louis leaves at this stage, and they offer you like like fares to kind of buy, buy the continuous voyage for the whole thing. Um, did they do it? What's your thought? Do you do you think they did it sort of to get more passengers, or because they? understood that the more convenient you make it the better for everyone involved like uh, yeah 100 percent. i think um you know this is a 
A concept that I borrowed from the historian Will McIntosh about the commodification of travel, where mm -hmm. you know, prior prior to this point, uh, uh, people really had to work <laughs> to right. figure out how to get in between one place to another. Uh, there were not, you know, there were not hotels everywhere. There were not necessarily roads everywhere. Yeah. Um, so it was a, it was a big it was a big deal. And one of the things that these corporations do is make travel something that you can purchase. Uh, 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 that one. Something that you have to, um, it's in the way and a book and outside of it of railroad companies um owning their own steamships to mm -hmm. or or owning stagecoach lines uh so that uh because the more destinations you can offer mm -hmm. to someone um uh the the more likely they are going to be to buy uh buy a ticket uh so yeah i just, uh the corporations had every incentive uh to try to partner with uh or own outright uh different modes of transportation mm -hmm if that would help them uh, increase the number of destinations or the convenience mm -hmm. uh, that they could offer. Um, and you see this, I mean, you alluded to a couple examples. Another uh, that I saw a lot was uh, companies saying that we will check your baggage all the way through. You leave it on one train oh, and you great. don't have to worry about yeah. transfers. Yeah. Uh, your bags will automatically be uh, put on the next train, put on the boat, put on the coach, mm -hmm. what have you. Um, so yeah, the companies were definitely looking for ways to make things mm -hmm. convenient for passengers. Oh, great. Yeah. And I mean, we, we still love that today, right? Like I like when the airline checks my bags through all the way to the end and I don't have to reclaim them. <laughs> well, I, I mean, not only that, but it, it would, it would seem crazy to us, right? If, uh, yeah. if I, I mean, like when I fly to Iowa, I go through Chicago and it's inconceivable that they would say to me, okay, now get out, go on the tarmac, take your bag, put it in the other plane and get on the new plane. Like it's not even, I mean, it's not, not even something we would ever consider. So <laughs> yeah, it's, um, uh, but that transformation started yeah, uh, during this time period. Yeah. But I do want to cycle back to like, when you said like lack of sort of infrastructure in regard mm -hmm. to like hotels and food mm -hmm. and stuff that would kind of signal, even though the railroads eventually win that the steamboat should have the legs up because they have usually cabins on board where you could sleep overnight and you kind of kind of rest and you don't need to worry about where do I find something to eat or where do I need to, find a hotel now to stay overnight and stuff so yeah that that you're 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 pointing to a great advantage that steamboats um had and for longer for longer journeys you would see there might be a sleeping berth on a train but the steamboat uh could could easily be a floating hotel Mm -hmm. and yeah. uh a more convenient place to more convenient place to stay and so if you were you definitely see that in the in the primary sources if uh people if they're fortunate to fortunate enough to live in an area uh where there are multiple competing options then mm -hmm. that's that is entirely a consideration um and uh yeah okay then how do i feed myself on the train <laughs> uh well a couple of options one you can bring food with you okay uh two uh when the train stops at a station uh put down your window and say someone may try to sell you something through the window so um <laughs> and uh three uh there are also uh salesmen who um would just walk down the center aisle mm -hmm. uh as you know our Layout for, for trains in the United States uh, today is essentially what it was in the 19th century. So a center mm -hmm. aisle down the middle and then two rows of seats on either either side of that. And so uh, there were people who walked down the middle of a train selling uh, fruit, selling newspapers, selling books. Yeah. Um, and uh, But I think a lot of people also just sort of brought their own... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, food along as well yeah. and um 
So it, it, could, it could go both ways, bring your own or um, uh, take advantage of people trying to sell you things. Yeah. It's interesting where he says that I had to do a couple of train rides recently and uh, Germany now does a deposit system. Like when you get a plastic bottle, then you buy it and it's like 25 cents. When you bring it back, you get those 25 cents back. And there were a lot mm -hmm. of homeless people that hopped on the train in like Berlin and went through the garbage bins to look for those types of bottles people had thrown away. and. It, 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 in that case, it cuts both ways all of a sudden today, right? I can buy something on the train and somebody picks up this stuff and turns into money for themselves. <laughs> um, there was a lag in connection. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, uh, I, yeah, that, that's, that's fine. I think people very quickly uh, realized that a stopping train was going to be an opportunity for commerce. Uh, so if you didn't, uh, if, if people didn't bring their own, um, uh, food or, 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 uh, then there's, there's an opportunity to try to solve them something. And I think some, this is one area where at least I wasn't able to fully tease out from the literature, second uh, primary literature. Is this something that the railroad companies themselves are overseeing or in terms of Ooh. they're trying to make money from it themselves, or is it something they merely, um tolerate mm -hmm. and uh, so i can't give a definitive answer as to what degree possible you know at stations people trying to sell you stuff through the window uh or someone walking down the, the middle of the train yeah no it, it makes sense right it's like <laughs> you look at asia you look at russia or india it's still being done on to, to a certain degree today and yeah um, but I, I think where I was going to head to is like so you, you what you're alluding to is the importance of the station building right a sort of a place where where some of that commerce can take place where you can have like a person selling at newspapers or or vegetables or mm -hmm. fruit or sandwiches or whatever and um how do I have to imagine it? Like either a steamboat landing or um, a railroad station during this period. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think uh, you know the classic historian answer is it depends, and so it's it's gonna be, it's gonna be one thing in rural South Carolina and another in in Philadelphia, um, but I think as a general rule, these would definitely be sites of. Um, activity, uh, you know these. I think to your question about you know railroad stations the 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 scale may be different uh, depending on where you were at geographically but I think no matter where uh, you were located there was going to be a lot of activity uh, mm. it's goods being loaded and unloaded uh, mm. it's passengers getting on and off uh, it's people saying goodbye uh, mm. to 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 the people they love it's welcoming welcoming them back mm -hmm. uh, if they've been gone. Uh, for a long time. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of activity, there's emotion, uh, there's stuff moving around. Uh, so it, it's, you know, maybe different in a rural outpost than it would be in a big city like Philadelphia. Mm. But, but even if the scale is different, the, uh, the, the basic function is going to be the same. And these railroad stations were also, uh, you know, going back to the point about the, the community, Mm -hmm. um you know these were also gathering places for yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. for remember. other for, for other types of events and mm -hmm. so there could be uh political meetings there yeah. could be uh religious services uh these are there could be musical concerts uh if a, if a smaller community didn't have a lot of other large structures uh that that could serve for that purpose uh, then railroad stations or railroad cars uh, could get pressed into service uh, for uh, to <laughs> serve uh, for these other functions. Didn't you like, make sure the connection works? <laughs> uh, uh, which is another great example of structure uh, in ways that the 
Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. Um, uh, it, okay. Uh, in, in ways that the corporation didn't intend. Yeah, I, I seem to remember you had like a story in there of like, um, wasn't there like an event in a railroad station was like a thousand people or something? Yeah, uh, it, it was a, a the the Swedish Nightingale Jenny Lind uh, Yeah, gave a yeah, gave yeah. a gave a gave a concert uh, in a uh, I'm not gonna remember exactly, but a, a railroad station in Massachusetts, and uh, it was. Um, I mean, if you know the 19th century, you know, she was wildly popular. And, uh, and so, yeah, that was a great, uh, that's a great example of this, uh, uh, infrastructure being pressed into use for something that was not originally intended. Yeah. yeah i just like i, I just trying to imagine a like a railroad station and i think it was on the second level Yeah. with that many people <laughs> and not collapsing or something Well, they, 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 they pulled it off. So Yeah, it was, everyone made uh, it out alive, I guess. every, everyone made it out alive and they got to hear Jenny Lind. So, so there you go. Oh, good God. Um, but, oh yeah, that, that led to the other one that you, you had a, I think it's the last chapter, actually, you devote to sort of practical tips that people give, especially for women travelers. And, They always, I, I love the part where you kind of, one of the suggestions was like, tie a ribbon around your back so you can easily recognize that, which is like, it's brilliant. We still do it at the baggage claim, right? Like my wife puts always a ribbon around our bags so that we can easily spot it, right? Like a really big like tie that I put around mine to kind of easily see it. And I thought it was brilliant, right? Like, it, but Let me ask it this way. Which of these suggestions that you saw was the one where you kind of went, that's weird? <laughs> oh my um i don't know that i'm going to remember them all uh but it's um I just want one or two, I, right? <laughs> you don't need yeah to give me a list. oh yeah um i thought it was weird um i think oh, i'm sorry i don't know that i'm going to be able to pull one up uh it's I, but, but Let me say this about the suggestions. One of the interesting things to me about this particular topic was um, we it's a good example of material where we're only getting one side of the story. Mm. And so we can see a, a mm. parent writing to a child saying, do this, 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 this. But we don't know if the child was like, Ah, come on, Dad, forget it. Or do do they take it really seriously? Right, um, right. And so I think I the the suggestions. I'm sorry, I can't uh, remember a good example for you, um, but I it, they are something where um, as a writer or someone looking back or a historian looking back at the time period, I tried to remain cognizant that um, we have no idea if. Um, those suggestions were sort of gratefully received or <laughs> seen as an annoyance. Um, right. And I think this particularly comes up when it's men uh, writing to women, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because they're, then there's the patronizing. The exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. So did, I mean, I would obviously love to know this part of it, but we just don't, I mean, were the women thinking, well, of course I know that. Like, what do you, what, 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 what do you think? You think I'm stupid, me? right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so yeah. I, I, I try to be a little careful. Uh, I think the hints are good to know because of exactly what you pointed out. Like some of them are really good and we still, we yeah. still use them and they make perfect sense. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, this is one of those um, archival silence issues where we just don't know how they were received. Right. And uh, particularly with that power dynamic between the person writing and the person receiving, mm. uh, there's a bit of a gap there that unfortunately, yeah, I don't know how we would, how we would fill it. Um, Time travel. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, it's, um, It's sort of weird thinking about you know time travel. I I, I never want to go back and meet famous people. I want to go back and be like, okay, what 
when someone wrote you this letter, what did you think? <laughs> and like the, the 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 people I've been working with to try to get that other half of the story. Yeah, um, no, there, there are a few people the, I would like to slap in the ordinary people I would like to slap and be like, why didn't you write down this? <laughs> But I'm, but I'm grateful for what we have, yeah. and I think the accumulation of these travel tips also speaks to the normalization of what was happening. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we go when I get we go from amazement to here are my ten strategies for going from New York to Boston. Yeah, yeah. And 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 when I do these things, I know that I want to be in the last car. I know that I want you know to mark my luggage in this way. I know that I want to buy the ticket at that booth and not this booth. I mean, just all the things. Right. that um we all do when we travel we accumulate knowledge and and, and figure out what's going to work for us yeah. and um that that happened back then as well yeah now and there's one that you you missed one that i actually read an article about this this morning that i did not know apparently a very inefficient deutsche bahn has an opportunity for for five euro you can reserve a seat but if you don't claim your seat within 15 minutes your reservation goes away ah okay. and there are a lot of instances where you have to kick somebody who is in your seat out of your seat actually but you have this beautiful story in the book i love that story of a massive argument on the train over somebody leaving their seat, somebody else taking their seat, and then arguing about who owns the seat. Yeah, this uh, this one I do remember, <laughs> and and this you is can't a, forget that one. No, 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 no. That that one was unforgettable, and it's a I, you know it's a great example in my mind of watching in real time how norms are constructed. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's no the the railroad company, uh, unlike the Deutsche Bahn, uh, the railroad company in this case was not setting up the rules right. for seat occupancy. It is something that the passengers were, in this case, literally arguing about among themselves. And if you get up and you didn't leave anything in the seat to mm -hmm. mark your place, then uh, your rights to that seat are are over and uh if the, the example that you're alluding to um not only is there an argument but all the other passengers are getting into it as well everyone everyone around them saying you know stand your ground don't give it up it's uh and so it's a and and the fact that that happened that the rest of the people in the car were becoming engaged in this yeah, argument that was, that was brilliant and that that points to this norm construction mm -hmm. where one of the people in that argument can say, I've got everybody else behind me. You may think you know the rules, but you don't. <laughs> We're we know the rules. This is what the rules are, and I have the right to this seat. And so I'm but grateful. It's a challenge because it's the unwritten rules, right? Yes. You, 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 there are, there's no document that says this is how it works. And, and I, so, I can imagine for like like a foreign traveler coming from Britain who works under a different set of rules, that's ex extremely challenging. Or like, like maybe there were regional differences south to north where that would be a, diff di a big challenge too. And that's, you know, something, uh, I mean, you've, you, you've lived in other countries. I've traveled abroad, like uh, any norm like that, you're, you sort of move a little gingerly. <laughs> you're yeah. sort of like, uh, Okay, am I supposed to tip this guy or do I not tip? I mean, like, don't you know, start. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's it's the things you don't know. Right. And so as a historian, I am really grateful that someone took the time to True. describe this argument and write it down uh, yes. because it gives us a wonderful window into how these unwritten rules were constructed. Mm -hmm. And I think more importantly, in this case, enforced. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you're right. If you don't know the rules and you step into a social situation, uh, it uh, it can be painful. Um, yes. But uh, this was a great. Uh, I'm 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 really glad that someone took the opportunity to write about this, and they would have done so 
Um, I believe this one is from a newspaper article. So they would have written this knowing that their audience would be like nodding in agreement as they're reading along. And some it's mm. it's a way for this it's it's a way for this nor we they are unwritten rules, but in a story when a story like this is published, that sort of helps disseminate them. Right. And then someone can read that article in the newspaper and say, Oh, okay, well, the next time I get on board, I better make sure I leave my hat. Yeah. But if I get up, because then that's the only way that I know I'm gonna have my seat so this this norm construction is happening in the moment and then oh. thanks to this newspaper article it can sort of spread out yeah um yeah. but it's that it's that on the moment in the train that i think i find the most um is the most fascinating yeah. uh, sort of window into how that happened yeah no i, I love that that that, <laughs> that was such a great story in there um all right, let me look at some of my talking points here as we get towards sort of, sort of the last stretch for us here today. Okay. And there's so much more in there, but I briefly want to at least give a nod to to race because that was, you have to cheat now. I think you devoted two chapters to that topic. Yeah, so I, I have one chapter on black passengers and one on white women. So, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, and so let's let's do the black passengers because I really I remembered like uh, when I was in Georgia, I had a student who worked with the National Park Service, and they they mm. they researched for the National Park Service actually the Croft story because they were in Macon and took sort of train down to Savannah and like the whole hiding in plain sight kind of thing that they they did. And of course, in the context of that, Box Brown came up as well. And I was not aware that there were a lot of Box Browns. Yeah, I, I was not aware either. Uh, this is my, this is totally my own um, ignorance. And I, I I promise you, this just came from reading the newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I mean, I was going through the, the black press and going for you know any mention of a train or steamboat that i could find yeah. and uh and this stuff is in there and i think it really um you know you know obviously the the, the cheat stories that get published are the ones where the people get caught that's how we we we, we know about it but it, mm -hmm. i think it really points to the ingenuity yeah. and um the, the ingenuity and the determination uh right. of, of people uh who were enslaved to use whatever means they could grab onto to um if they if they saw an opportunity to to escape and it is um you know one thing <laughs> i've been i've been working on this book for a very long time i mean as i alluded at the beginning this is not my my main work so it's something that i have to do when i have sort of sort of time outside of my job uh the one thing that i've definitely noticed in the historiography over the past 10, 15 years is that our understanding of um, uh, the Underground Railroad and sort of how it operated and the different aspects of it has really mm -hmm. um, sort of exploded. Yeah. Uh, at least it seems to me, sort of works by R.G.M. Blackett mm -hmm. and Churchill and 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 mm -hmm. so on and so forth. I really contributed to my own understanding of what was possible yeah. uh, in terms of people attempting to escape. Um, but you have to admit, but, I mean, it's it's bold, it's daring, it's crazy oh, to kind of put incredible. yourself in a box, mail yourself. You don't know how long it will take. Like, I don't even want to think of like food and toilet needs. <laughs> yeah, mean, uh, or or breathing. I mean, or, just or like, breathing, I mean, yeah. yeah. So uh, each one of these stories is incredible. And that's I think that's why yeah. I took the time to make sure I detailed all of them. Uh, as best I could, you know, usually we just yeah. have one or two newspaper accounts. Um, but I try, uh, I promise you, everyone that I could find is in the book <laughs> because every single one of them was incredible. Yeah. And I think it is, um, you know, again, I'm, since I'm not a, you know, an, an expert in, you know, fugitive slave act or anything like that, I, I don't want to, you know, step too far outside the bounds of my knowledge. But for me, at least, coming to this as an outsider, you know, Henry Box Brown is the one that I knew. Yeah. Uh, and and the rest of these were uh, were at least to me a surprise. Uh, so I 
Uh, but it's one of those things again that once you read it, you're like, you you know exactly uh, that this is this is going to be a critical part of the story. But it's, uh, as soon it's, as, in the moment I think you're doing the research, also what's so fascinating about it is that it's not imitations, right? Because right. the slave in Arkansas is not going to have read anything or heard anything about Box Brown. They came up with that on their own, right? Well, and Like, and then some of them predated. yeah. Uh, Again, uh, his his effort. So, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, people. <laughs> as I knew from my first book, uh, enslaved people played a crucial role in building and operating transportation networks in the South. And as they were doing that, they were also creating a potential means of escape, Mm -hmm. uh, not only for themselves but also for their. Uh, for their families, for their brothers and sisters, their compatriots, everyone who was uh, around them. Now, that doesn't mean it was easy uh, and it, and because, um, you know, railroads and steamboats are very visible. <laughs> and they're Mm-hmm. very, <laughs> Yeah. and, Yeah. and, but, uh, but if you could get on one, whether either by hiding yourself or disguising yourself or, you know, having, you know, someone you're working with help you, it's the fastest way out of the South. <laughs> uh, and so the, the risk reward uh, ratio uh, is pretty, uh, is pretty substantial uh, because if, if you can make it work, um, it's, um, it's fast. And then on the other side of the Ohio river, um, this is again, where I'm, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his first name, but the historian's last name is Churchill, who's written about uh, sort of the the path to freedom north of the Ohio River. Uh, you know, groups that might have in the 1820s and 30s uh, been responsible for hiding people and moving them at night, at least based on Churchill's scholarship, you know, by the 40s and 50s, they were just buying train tickets. <laughs> and so you could, um, it, it became a crucial part of moving people who had escaped slavery up to Canada um, just by using the regular transportation infrastructure. So it, it had an enormous impact um, on, on people who were, uh, people who escaped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, I, I also loved how you had those conductors who were very, like, nice about it, right? Like, there's an escapee, and, like, there was this one story where you, like, like, told him to, like, get off and run to the woods, and the train, or the train, and the train pulls off with the catchers on board, and they have to go back Yeah. eventually, and, like... Yeah. And, and again, for me, I just can't even, it's just so incredible to imagine the bravery Yeah, uh, that it would of have taken all. to do, for, for, to do that. Cause you have no idea. You may not know how the person's going to react, right? You're, Yeah. you're going up to them saying, you know, can, can you hide me? Can you, uh, can you help me escape? And I think, um, you know, we were talking about depots, earlier uh depots ended up becoming very sort of public places of where slavery uh if it was if you lived in the north and slavery was just sort of an abstract concept uh you like you knew it was happening in the south but it didn't sort of impinge on your day-to-day -day life Mm -hmm. a railroad station is a place where that may have changed forever <laughs> Mm -hmm. because Yeah. if there is um an enslaved person who has escaped, Mm -hmm. let's say they've made north of the Ohio River, and then they're, the, the slave owner comes up after them, Mm -hmm. an argument about uh, what, you know, what is going to happen to this person um, may well have taken place right there in that train station, like in, in the car that you're sitting in. And trains are interesting. You know, they operate on schedules and time management was really important to train safety. And so that creates sort of a pressure, like this train is going to leave. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so There's uh, a deadline. I, there's a deadline. And so um, I think it's entirely um, conceivable that for, if, if you're a Northern, if you're a Northern white person who 
uh, maybe didn't think too much about slavery, a railroad station or being on a train mm -hmm. might have been a place where that abstract political issue became suddenly very real and relevant. Right. And you can see yeah. the people in front of you who are impacted by it. And I think that's another just sort of interesting way in which railroads, steamboats, um, transportation in general mm -hmm. uh, becomes um really relevant to larger social mm -hmm. and cultural issues. It's not just about getting from point yeah. A to point B. Well, and you have that too, with like the abolitionists, right? On the trains kind of preaching. Sure. <laughs> it's, it's Yeah, absolutely. A captive audience, I kind of felt. Yeah, like, yeah this, this is another, um, I think, example of um, what was, well, at least to me, is inconceivable. And I assume for most people traveling mm -hmm. today, to me, it's impossible to imagine that if I got on a plane, someone would stand up and say, you know, let's do a straw poll of how we think the presidential election is going to turn out this November. And then everybody on the plane votes and they like read off the tally. But those sort of political activities and yeah. discussions and they took place. Sort of, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think that's a. Um, uh, I just can't imagine that happening in current transit, but in, in the 19th century, that was uh, definitely something that would happen. If I could say, I, I took a moment to look him up because I want to make sure he gets credit. It's Robert Churchill is the historian I was referring to earlier. And his, his work uh, has been really, really important to me. So I want to make sure I get his name correct. So thank, thank you me. for that. <laughs> yeah, no, I was kind of, kind of trying to think of some of the train rides over the last year or so I had and like it it would be hard to imagine even today on a train in, in Europe right like sure he gets a drunk who's like singing and acting weird and like a have a train car is bothered by it but it's, it's not going to be the entire train that is impacted by that yeah or like sort of eagerly getting involved in a political conversation okay, yeah exactly yeah right? like, like um heated debates that wouldn't take place these days like, no no like, can you so, imagine uh, the pre presidential debating presidents presidential candidates in the amtrak lounge on the yeah like, train to the pacific northwest yeah no that it's just not just not something that's part of our current life. No, it's uh, not. For, for which I'm grateful. So, yes, no. yes, I agree. Even though you get sometimes to sit next to weird people on the train, uh, on the on the planes. <laughs> Trains too, but that's less yeah. so in the U.S. the case. Um, but uh, we kind of said we were going to do about 90 minutes for our okay. get together today. So we are at actually a little over that, so I don't want to impact your further commitments today on on friday oh no well it's it's been wonderful for the opportunity to talk about some of the themes in the book i'm really grateful for your interest and those of your of your audience and so thank you so much for, yeah uh, we for scratch the, the surface guys we only scratch the surface there is <laughs> like there are two chapters that we didn't even talk about in there there's there's tons of great information in in aaron's book <laughs> Um, but well, thank you. yeah, I appreciate you taking the time. I, I know State Department can be a big time commitment. Yeah, well, I'm uh, I'm so fortunately today's my day off, so oh. I've uh, I've got a uh, I've, uh, I've I'm happy to take the time to do it. I'm grateful to you for setting this up, and thank you, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. I, again, I appreciate it. And if anyone is interested, Aaron Maris's book is The American Transportation Revolution, A Social and Cultural History, coming out with John Hopkins University Press. So anywhere where you can find books, you can find Aaron's book. And if you are thinking about revising your Jacksonian America or however your university calls it, <laughs> class it is a, has some great stories for class for mm. for lectures in it i would argue um so thank you aaron great thanks so much